So uh, thank you all for coming to our Office of Public Records, public presentation of our programming report for our new DC State Archives located on the campus of UDC. Um, before we begin, I would like to uh, welcome Kimberly Bassett, Secretary of State for Washington, DC, who will bring greetings. And you're muted, Secretary Bassett. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. On behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser, um, Senior Advisor Beverly Perry, and myself, I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. Isn't this exciting? Our first meeting to discuss the new DC State Archives. This is an exciting time for us, and we're very, very happy about this. I'd like to thank some of our friends and colleagues from the Department of General Services, I'd like to thank Friends of the Archives. Um, I'd also like to thank, thank our Friends of um, the Archive Advocates. I'd also like to thank the Archives Advisory Group. I'd like to give a shout out to Hartman Cox as well. And we just like to thank you. We look forward to more of these calls. We will um, definitely keep you well informed and we just ask that you have any comments or suggestions to um, feel free to post them. Feel free to call us. We're very open. We're going to be transparent through this process. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And back to you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you uh, so much, Secretary Bassett. And thank you for your support of this project as well. Um, with everyone's support that we are moving this project forward. And I just wanted to let you all know that my name is Lopez Matthews Jr. and I am the new State Archivist and Public Records Administrator for the Office of Public Records. And I'm very excited to have you all here today. I'm very excited to present this uh, programming report to you all. We've put a lot of work into it over the past several months. And so we're excited to share it with you and excited to get your feedback. I'm going to put um, a link to our public comments form in the chat so that you can submit your comments to us about the report. And also, if you have some questions that you would like to ask during this presentation, please place them in the chat and we will uh, discuss them during question and answer. So if you have questions, please place them in the chat and we will read them off at the end of the presentation during our Q&A session. So Dr. Like Lopez, yeah. I also forgot to mention um, our partner UDC. They're on the call as well today. Go Firebirds. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you all. Thank you for being here as well, uh, members of the UDC community. We're excited to uh, be located on campus and we will talk about some of the synergies that will happen there a little later in the presentation as well. So uh, I'd like to introduce Scott Texera, who will uh, give our presentation today from Hartman Cox. Take it away, Scott. All right, so we're ready. Um, well, that was quite a bit of excitement and enthusiasm. I'll do my best uh, to reflect that same level of excitement as, um, as I walk uh, everyone through our presentation today. Um, uh, like Dr. Matthew said, my name is Scott Texera. I'm um, a partner at Hartman Cox Architects and um, leading uh, our team of architects and engineers. Uh, we've got um, over a dozen uh, consulting engineers and specialty consultants that are assisting with this effort. Um, uh, and principally, our work is in uh, collaboration with EYP, Architecture Engineering. Uh, both our firms are based here in DC. Um, uh, but we do work nationally and uh, both possess uh, specialized expertise in the design of archival facilities. Um, and we've been working with the city uh, since 2015 together um, on uh, evaluating uh, the programmatic requirements for this project, assisting with site selection, um, examining various different uh, development scenarios and, and site uh, analyses. Uh, all of which has culminated in this uh, program verification effort, which we began a couple months ago, and that we're going to be presenting today. Um, 
uh, it's um, I think very important uh, to include public input in the process of design. Uh, we we believe quite strongly that uh, designs are better when they can reflect uh, the input of the of their community. And in this case, we're not just talking about you know the local community that lives around this site, but also the uh, students and staff and faculty at uh, the university and, of course, the community of users that uh, use uh, the DC Archives facility and um, and that will continue to use it. So um, our presentation today is organized much in the same format as the report document that uh, OPR uh, published onto the website uh, um, last week, I believe. And um, the the document is divided into eight chapters, and so we will be uh, uh, spending a few minutes discussing each. And I'm just going to advance the slide. So, um, you know, the principal purpose of the programming phase of a project, uh, which is where we are, uh, you know, no design has begun yet. I should have mentioned this actually in my opening remarks, but. Um, is you know what are you designing right and that is a program so a pro a programming is the process uh, where we prioritize and identify all the goals for a project um, you know manage and arrange all the interests to create consensus among various user groups and uh, and then communicate formally uh, the critical decisions and priorities uh, for the project um, it's presented in a, a, a a complete program document which allows uh, the subsequent design phases to proceed more efficiently, saves time and money for the client. It also gives the designers a valuable back check uh, to make sure that uh, all of the goals and objectives are being achieved. Um, so what are those goals? All right, so for this project, uh, they are to preserve the history of the District of Columbia, create a state-of-the-art facility, provide mission control services to all of the agencies of the DC government, including records management, education, and resource sharing, uh, optimize the facility for space and centralized storage of records, processing, digitization, public access, exhibits, offices, and to maintain a cost-effective, secure, environmentally controlled archival and record center storage facility. Uh, optimize these uh, temperature and humidity, uh, humidity, excuse me, humidity, performance and controls, and eliminate air infiltration. And to do all this uh, in in um, consistent with the city's uh, goals for sustainability in this project is going to be designed to achieve LEED Gold certification. So a little bit of background. Our work began back in um, 2015 uh, on the heels of other predecessors who had studied um, the state of affairs at the DC Archives and Office of Public Records. Uh, uh, this slide reviews a few prior studies. Uh, the earliest that we produced down at the bottom here is the uh, a preliminary program report back in 2015. Um, our efforts, unlike some of our predecessors, are focused uh, entirely on the design of a building. Uh, some early studies uh, discuss other issues that aren't about the facility and um, and uh, we uh, don't have involvement in, in those topics. Our charge is to uh, help design the facility. So um, OPR was established uh, by the secretary in uh, 1986. Uh, uh, well, established in the office of the secretary in 1986 by a mayoral order um, to preserve the history of the DC government. And their mission involves three services which is the caretaking of the district's archives, its record center, and its library of government information. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the existing OPR facility on Naylor Court, uh, it's pictured here on the right side of the screen. It, 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 it holds uh, both uh, their archives, well, a portion of the archives and a portion of the record center holdings. Um, it is supplemented by uh, other federal facilities uh, for the National Archives and Record Center, both uh, uh, their archives and uh, their record centers. And it has uh, long since reached its capacity and is uh, 
struggling with end of life issues and and um, so uh, our project uh, creates the opportunity to move uh, this agency and and all of its staff and holdings into a brand new facility. So, um, uh, oh, in addition uh, to the uh, holdings that are uh, at Naylor Court and uh, with the National Archives, uh, many, many records uh, not yet surveyed uh, are still in the custody, custody of agencies and are held uh, at agency sites throughout the city. So uh, our process began with trying to evaluate uh, all of these holdings, uh, the archival records, permanent records, and um, temporary records. And what we considered as part of that estimating process was not only uh, the existing holdings at Naylor Court, but also the existing holdings um, at the offsite storage uh, sites managed by the National Archives. Um, we considered the lists of uh, holdings uh, of records that were provided by OPR for non-surveyed records held by agencies um, at multiple sites throughout the city. And then we um, aggregated all that data and we went through a process of estimating uh, percentages of permanent record center holdings that are most likely overdue for accessioning into the archives. And similarly, we estimated uh, temporary records that are most likely overdue for destruction. Uh, the end result of that evaluation and estimating process is uh, this table, uh, which uh, presents the quantity of records uh, for which our project is going to be designed uh, uh, in cubage or by volume. Uh, so uh, the existing Archival records is 45,000 approximately uh, cubic feet. The existing uh, record center records uh, with a permanent disposition, uh, meaning that they will eventually become accessioned into the archives, is 87, 88, uh, approximately 1,000 cubic feet. And then we applied a 25% growth factor on top of that of 33,000 for a grand total of archival storage space of 166,000 cubic feet. Um, then uh, we are also gonna be designing for approximately 115,000 cubic feet of temporary record center records. So uh, another major factor in a design of a facility like this is the uh, storage provisions, the um, Records uh, can be stored at a variety of different densities using fixed shelving systems or compact mobile shelving systems and at heights, you know, up to 30, 30 shelves high. Uh, and so uh, our earlier studies from years back had recommended uh, what our team had believed was the most cost effective um, a sort of balanced uh, solution of 15 shelves high, but in further consultation with uh, consulting archivists and with uh, Dr. Matthews himself, uh, once uh, he took his position uh, at OPR, um, we realized uh, the many disadvantages that shelving at that height uh, can present. And so uh, we have updated the program to be based on uh, 11 shelves high, um, which uh, is just, behold, just below the threshold of a lot of um, uh, triggers in the building code for specialized safety provisions. And so uh, uh, the all the parties in the programming process considered 11 high uh, to be sort of the best balance of density um, and retrievability. So um, with Oh, and those densities, and it may not be on the slide, but once we establish a shelving density, we're able to convert the volume of records into area. And that enables us then to tackle the process of developing a, a space program. Um, and uh, so the fifth chapter in the program report uh, summarizes uh, in tabular form all the all you know all the spaces in the program by category, reception areas, reference and reading areas, record storage areas and staff work areas. Um, and uh, this table here uh, presents 
sort of a rolled up summary of all of those areas by category. So, uh, you know, total reception area spaces are about 8,250 square feet. And, you know, I'm not going to recite all of these. Uh, but it's all in the report. Uh, it builds to a, a net total of about 75,000 square feet. Um, however, uh, once you apply the various grossing factors to account for things like structure and partitions and circulation zones and restrooms and uh, building support facilities and mechanical rooms and all of that, uh, the 75,000 extends to uh, a gross square footage estimate of about 101,600 square feet. Um, surprisingly, uh, not very far off of where we were seven years ago and not far off from uh, DGS's internal projections um, back when we saw the very first RFP for this project uh, uh, at the end of 2014. So um, we then uh, wanted to make sure that we were being responsible in terms of growth provisions. Um, uh, the growth was built into this uh, program uh, in multiple layers, uh, uh, beginning first with the very conservative um, assumptions that we made during the estimating process. Uh, just a quick example, I think we uh, considered you know, permanent records at about 20% of the volume of what uh, a government produces, whereas uh, on the advice of our consulting archivists, uh, um, most state archives consider about 5% of the records generated by a state government to be worth you know, saving permanently. So, um, uh, so those conservative estimates, I think embed uh, sort of a, a, some embodied growth capacity uh, and then we applied uh, deliberate growth at 25%. And then also this project seeks to co-locate the city's record center uh, with the archives, uh, which is uh, not very common. Um, and uh, and that uh, record center component uh, actually provides an opportunity for future expansion uh, at, at the end of the, you know, many, many years from now, uh, we, the expansion planning horizon is about 50 years, typically, at which point uh, that storage area could also be converted into archival storage and uh, boost uh, the growth capacity of the facility yet again. So um, <clears throat> the sixth section of the report uh, delves deeply into the technical requirements for every type of space in the building. Um, both quantitative and qualitative. It, uh, it, it uh, talks about, you know, all of the criteria, not, not just how big it is, but, you know, what are the acoustic requirements? You know, what does it need in the way of lighting and power, specialized equipment, you know, um, uh, f fundamental adjacencies with other functions and, and so forth. And so uh, we begin that discussion in our report uh, with a graphic program. Uh, the graphic program converts those areas that you see in tabular form uh, to you know blocks that are to scale reflective of their programmed size and um, helps uh, people at least graphically understand which spaces are large which are small um, and then we go through by category uh, with these adjacency diagrams in this case uh, these are the uh, sort of reception area functions, which include a lobby, you know, lounges, uh, exhibit gallery, multi-purpose meeting facilities. And, um, and what I wanna make sure I mention as we go through this set of slides in today's presentation is that the photographs that we've included in this presentation are, are not, you know, they're, they're not renderings of the design of this project, right? This project hasn't started design yet. These are images that we provided uh, to Dr. Matthews and to others uh, that were a part of this process and provided for anyone who is re referencing this, this report as just representative examples of, of the types of spaces. Um, so this is a, a lobby from some other building in a, and uh, you know, in, on this slide, you know, this is an exhibit gallery from some other facility, a meeting room from some other facility but it, it does communicate sort of the general character and nature of the space. 
which helps people understand uh, better, you know, what 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 the program is requiring. Um, and so uh, we repeat this again for the research center functions. And uh, uh, unique to this project uh, as as, um, as part of the co-location with uh, the university is a um, is the inclusion of the uh, university archives collection and the Felix E. Grant Jazz Archives, um, which uh, will share a lot of the resources of OPR's facility with the um, archival storage environments and the research facilities and, and um, processing areas. And, and the program was also bolstered here with a few additional spaces that, that are dedicated for UDC's use. Uh, some offices and an additional processing suite for um, for their own holdings. Um, and, and then, of course, staff work areas uh, are addressed. And then the back of house spaces, the records receiving and for anyone that works in the field, these are perhaps the most crucial. <laughs> um, uh, and then um, the seventh section of our document, uh, focuses on um, at a highly technical level um, all of the various uh, design considerations of the of the engineering systems of the building uh, it begins with the overarching uh, criteria that the facility is going to be designed uh, to meet the requirements of uh, standards published by the National Archives uh, by the, the Society of American Archivists and um, uh, the record center portion uh, Oh, wait a minute, let's see. I got ahead of myself, apologies. And uh, so some highlights of some of those standards uh, are presented on this slide. Um, you know, obviously, the uh, in addition to being built, uh, designed and built to meet with codes, um, uh, the facilities uh, uh, to meet narrow standards has uh, higher uh, restrictions in terms of fire resistance um, and material selections, uh, the, the floor load limits are, are going to be highly specialized to deal with the heavy weight of the storage systems um, and uh, various other site selection criteria that are prescribed by those standards. And, um, and then also the air tightness and the envelope sturdiness of the building, envelope referring to its moisture and thermal um, enclosure uh, of the facades, roof and foundations and so forth. Um, so specifically, the narrow standard that uh, we're referencing is the standard 1571, which I understand through discussion just a few minutes ago was um, was updated recently and now goes by 1571 S. Uh, and um, and then. Uh, and within that standard are the criteria for the storage environments, which we summarize here uh, for the various different types of media, paper, uh, photographs, film, acetates, and, and so forth, which all have different uh, storage uh, environments uh, to promote their, their preservation. Um, and then the record center portion of our project will be designed uh, to meet both 1571, but uh, starting with the criteria given for record centers, which is in 36 CFR 1234. Um, and that's to enable that future convertibility uh, that I referenced earlier in these remarks. And then again, to touch on sustainability, uh, we'll be achieving lead gold for this project um, on top of uh, all of those other design criteria. The eighth and uh, last section in the report uh, discusses site analysis. It, it provides um, an overview of the site selection at UDC. Uh, this project will be built on the site of Building 41. Uh, Building 41 was uh, studied uh, in um, much detail in 2018. It was uh, determined that it uh, is, is not um, able to be repurposed uh, for this project. So uh, our project will be selectively demolishing uh, the above grade portion of Building 41 and uh, the new OPR facility will be built on the same site. We don't know exactly its shape or specific extents, but it's going to be built in this general area. Um, 
on top of the existing garage or through the existing garage as the structural engineers uh, uh, make a point uh, to uh, point out to me when I chat with them. Um, and uh, but this site at UDC creates a, um, a number of exciting co-location opportunities. We review this in some of the subsections in Chapter 8, uh, not only with uh, the archival collections that the university has, which I reviewed earlier, but there's a number of other synergies that we're hoping uh, can be realized uh, over time uh, with um, the uh, OPR facility being at uh, the Van Ness campus for UDC. Um, these benefits uh, include, you know, sharing of resources and um, uh, and actually more specifically, uh, the program, the 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 programming opportunities that uh, could result from this co-location, which we summarize on this slide, um, are not only uh, sharing records and collection storage and and the various different functional spaces of the OPR uh, facility, but also um, opportunities for education, training, internships, work study programs, uh, uh, joint research projects. Um, joint public programs, uh, special exhibitions, and uh, special events that can occur in the meeting spaces. So, um, lastly, I'm going to end our prepared remarks uh, with just this quick little snapshot of the project uh, schedule. Um, so, the pre design uh, phase uh, is going to be. Um, uh, well, we're, we're, we're at the end of pre-design uh, presently, and in the uh, coming fiscal year, we'll be um, carrying out the design development phases of the project. And then the year after that is when we anticipate uh, completing the construction documents for the project, and uh, approximately two years of construction uh, will follow that. And um, I hope, Dr. Matthews, that we hit all of the highlights, um, but I'm going to turn it back over to you to field um, any questions that may have uh, that any of the attendees this evening might want to ask us. <clears throat> Great, and um, I think we have a pretty well-contained group here. So if someone has a question, you can just, uh, I think you can raise your hand in Teams and I can, allow you to speak because right now in general most people can't unmute themselves so if you have a question use the hand raise function and i should be able to unmute you but i will say one of the questions that um, we tend to see and that we tend to get is will the building be big enough to hold all of our records <laughs> for the dc archives that's the Million dollar question that everyone asks. So, how would you uh, answer that, Scott? Well, it certainly ought to be, given uh, how uh, many years of study have gone into um, establishing a program for this project. Uh, I may turn this over to Michelle Pacifico, who's the consulting archivist with our team, who has uh, also reported, I think, to you and us. Uh, comparisons with other state archives that have been built in the last decade or so um, that have governments comparable in size to the to the district government. And um, uh, I, my recollection from um, the information that she had shared is that we're like, like we're just right there on par with everyone. Um, and uh, so I have high confidence uh, that that our estimates are valid and that the program is valid. And um, and uh, let's see, Michelle, does, does, is there anything that you might be able to add uh, to address Dr. Matthews question about adequacy of size? Um, thank you, Scott. No, I, I think you said it very well. Um, we have been studying the collections, the growth of the collections, the status of the collections. Um, I've been studying it since 2014. Um, and we we really have um, run the numbers every way that we could to feel confident that the building is both large enough and has growth into the future. Um, if someone has specific questions, 
um, we can certainly attempt to uh, address them. But um, I'm with Scott. I feel pretty confident that we have gotten a good handle on the current collections um, and sort of what agencies are producing and where the DC Archives is going into the future. Yeah, and I think I can add, Dr. Matthews, that you know the 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 risk of undersigning and you know, the the there's a risk on both end of the spectrums, right? The the project could be undersized, it could be oversized, and and an oversized facility um, has just as many um, concerns as an undersized facility. They might not be the same concerns, right? But um, uh, you know, I think the reason why the city engages, uh, you know, expert consultants is to try to navigate that range and to try to figure out what is that right size, uh, which is what we have done. Um, so, um, you know, I can't prove it yet, uh, <laughs> but, but based on all of our analysis, uh, this is the right size for this building. And, and if I may add, you know, this is DGX. I, I think if we also refer to what um, Scott said in his presentation about growth, I, I think it's nice, you know, to 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 realize that we have several layers, you know, of growth, you know, factored into the um, the numbers that that is that are uh, dictating the footprint you know that we're working with i, I think it's more than adequate uh, i think we're also like scott said we want to be careful that we don't end up with a white elephant you know that day one and several years after is an empty space you know uh, we all know challenges that we have in the district about maintaining and keeping buildings you know and i don't think we want to they want you know just saddle ourselves with a lot of space that we don't have the resources, you know, and the and the funding, proper funding, you know, and material in place, you know, to keep it working as it's supposed to work. So it's a very delicate balance, you know, but I think that we are comfortable, you know, that the numbers, the projections, you know, uh, it's it's definitely adequate for day one, you know, and subsequent years, you know, of the of the new uh, facility. Thank you so much for that comment. And that was uh, Bola Williams from uh, the Department of General Services, just in case I didn't uh, introduce him to the uh, audience. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? You don't have to come off mute. You could type it in the chat and we will gladly answer your questions. Um, if you don't want to share it today, I did put in the chat the link to our public comments uh, where you could submit your thoughts to us about uh -oh. <laughs> Scott. I'm Sorry about that. So, um, where you could share your thoughts about the report, and we will definitely review them and see how you know see what we could do to incorporate your recommendations and your comments into the report. Right now, it is a draft report, so we're just really waiting to see what you, the public, have to say. So that we can make any updates or adjustments that you know will make the best archives for DC that we have that we can have. Yeah, I think that's the goal here. Everyone wants. And uh, Dr. Matthews, I understand that uh, you and the secretary have extended the public comment period. We have extended the public comment period. It was supposed to end September 21st, but we have extended the public comment period to September 30th at 11:59 p.m. So please, you know, review the report share your thoughts, and we will be um, on the lookout. Um, I did want to note that we do have a multi-purpose space that allows itself to host up to 300 people for presentations, but it also allows itself to be broken down into four separate rooms for meetings and trainings and events like that. So we have that combined with the exhibit gallery and the exhibit lobby. So part of what we're doing with this building is that it's not just about research, but we're also going to present the history of the city and allow it to be a space to almost serve like a city museum in a way, because we don't have a city museum in DC. So we'll kind of try to serve two roles in one building um, 
as the Office of Public Records. So we're very excited about um, what we're building here and what we're doing. I know it's been a long time coming as I have seen and heard. <laughs> so <laughs> we're just excited to be here. And yes, Katarina, the recording will be accessible online. We will put it on the Office of the Pu Office of Public Records YouTube page. I will put it up there myself. So you'll be able to share it with uh, everyone. Um, <clears throat> and I'll turn it off because that's my phone um, being chats. <laughs> and, and also we will definitely have this link, you know, on DGS, you know, web page. You know, just like we've been, you know, um, sharing all of the other documents, you know, related to the um, inventory program development and through the um, design, you know, and construction phase of the project, which is typical of all the projects that we execute in BGS. So please look out for that in addition to the uh, OPR, you know, a Facebook page. Thank you. Yeah. So everything will also be available on the DGS page, yeah. So uh, I got to mention that. <laughs> so uh, any other questions, comments? Give it a minute. So you're back, Secretary Bassett. Do you have a comment? Okay. No. No, I just really um, hope that everybody um, stays in touch with our office um, so that, you know, we can provide feedback and, you know, we're happy to hear about, I mean, hear your suggestions as well. I just want it to be a place where people feel that they could express their concerns or, or suggestions. I guess. Uh... And, and let me just add that this is just a start of what will be a continuing engagement, you know, with the public, you know, as we get into next phases, you know, and subsequent phases of this project. Thank so, you. We're going to be having more meetings like this to invite the public to hear from us and give their feedback and comments, particularly in the design phase and as we move forward. Yeah, and also, yeah. <laughs> I should also mention that this this project uh, will be uh, subject to the review and approval of external review agencies, the Commission of Fine Arts, and uh, that process also um, includes uh, public hearings and, and input. and uh, And in the lead up to that, we'll be meeting with uh, the local ANC, um, and so there there will be several opportunities for the public to. Um, keep pace with us and for us to you know share uh, the developing design and to get their input so well if uh, there are no more comments thank you all for joining us um, follow our Twitter page so you can keep updates on what we're doing and where we're going and thank you all for being here and look out for the recording on our Office of Public Records uh, YouTube channel. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.